Guys, how are we doing? Welcome to Good Works Tractors. I've rounded up 10 of the best random tractor questions for you in this episode, volume two, so stick around. Now I'll be able to answer some of these questions for you, but I might need your help to answer some of the others. And if you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button right underneath the video. Read through that description as well, all sorts of fun links down there for tractor owners, and check out the other fun videos on my channel. Can I put bigger wheels and tires on my tractor? You might be looking for more ground clearance, you, maybe you're looking for a better ride, more ballast weight, there could be a lot of reasons you want to get bigger tires for your machine. But can you actually do it? Well that's going to depend on your tractor, because not all tractors are created equal. If you take a look at a John Deere 1 series for example, these are only going to have one tire size available. Yes, multiple tread patterns, but only one tire size. But as you start to go bigger, you do start to have more options available for you on different tire sizes, wheel sizes as well. But if you are going to change your wheel and tire size, make sure you not only do the back side, but also do the fronts as well. Don't just do one or the other. If you wanted to put a bigger tire on a 1025, for example, you'd run into issues with the mower deck and probably clearance around uh, the fender area here on the back side as well. Do I need to flag off my lawn if I'm going to use a three-point dethatcher like this one right here? Well, I can tell you that question didn't even pop into my head before I dethatched my lawn earlier this fall, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, fortunately, it didn't matter, so I didn't notice any damage of any kind, not on sprinkler heads, not on sprays, not on valve box covers, nothing, you know, so, but I don't think that you really need to. These are just, you know, very light spring tines right here. They really just kind of glide right over top, you know, besides the weight of the attachment here itself, you just have a quick hitch and your three-point hitch arms. There's no down pressure that's digging into the ground, so it's, it's really just kind of skipping along as it goes along the ground. I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Why do quick hitches require bushings why do they need these things these are category one pins that fit inside here size them up to a category three now this is one i don't really have a good answer for the best thing i can figure up is that this is supposed to be some sort of a sacrificial anode so to speak where this material here will be softer than the, the quick hitch steel the pin steel and so if something is going to wear then it would be this instead of something else However, if that were true, then I'm sure I would have come across it before. I would have seen some set of bushings, I'm sure many of them, with significant wear along this rail as it makes contact with a quick hitch. I never have. I've also never seen any kind of significant wear in the grooves on a quick hitch either. And if we're talking about a concern with metal to metal contact, then what's the difference between a pin on a three-point attachment and then that ball that the pin goes through on a three-point arm? To sum it up, do any of you know the real answer besides just a way to make a few extra bucks? Now never fear, that's why the bushingless quick hitch is here. Notice the size of this lower link slot right here. See the size of that? You can't even fit one of these bushings in there if you tried. It's a direct pin fitment for a category one pin. So direct fit there, slap it right in there, no bushings required, latch it up and away you go. If there's anything on my face, I apologize. I just got done pounding a couple double stuffed Oreos. Do I prefer a power reverser or a hydrostatic transmission? Well, for me, I definitely prefer a hydrostatic transmission. However, a power reverser transmission has been proven to put more power to the ground. So if you have a hydrostatic transmission, you are simply sacrificing some of that power for convenience. And I think for most of us, that's just fine. We don't need to maximize every ounce of power that the machine has. So if you're gonna be able to trade a little bit of efficiency for the operator, say you're using a front end loader a lot and going back and forth, it's gonna be a lot quicker process to do so with a hydrostatic transmission over a power reverser. But this is where it really becomes user preference because depending on the applications that you have to tackle or that you think you're gonna tackle, it may lead you in one way or another. One additional benefit of a power reverser transmission is that it's typically going to be a decent amount cheaper than its hydrostatic counterpart. But keep in mind, not every model, not every series is going to have power reverser or even gear drive options available. Sometimes it's only going to be a hydro transmission. And sometimes when you get up to a big five series like this, you're only going to have a power reverser or a similar gear drive transmission available. Can I use a 60 inch rotary cutter or brush hog, as this is also called, on a 25 horsepower tractor? Well, I'm going to give you my take on that, which is yes and no. If we're talking about something like a John Deere 1025R or a BX2680, something along those lines, I'm going to say a firm no, you don't want to do it. However, if you step up to a 2 Series John Deere or a B Series Kubota like a B2601 John Deere 2025R, I would say, yeah, you're going to be just fine in most cases, even though the PTO requirements are going to be very borderline, perhaps not even enough. 
you know, there's really a lot more to it besides just the gearbox there. I know it seems really weird. You know, the specs probably say that there's not a single 60 inch brush hog out there that can actually technically operate on a little 25 horsepower tractor. However, for me, the bigger consideration is actually the weight and the position of that weight on the back of your machine. On a smaller one series tractor, you really just don't have the physical tractor weight that's up here to offset the weight that's back there on a 60 inch brush hog. That three point hitch back there isn't completely lock solid. So you have a little bit of that little sway feeling there that's going on, which can really shift that weight. And this isn't just right tucked neatly behind the back of your machine. This is several feet, maybe even five or six feet back out there to the very back of it. So it's really compounding that swaying effect there. And without the ballast, really, your tractor is almost that ballast weight offsetting the three point weight well, you just really feel it as an operator. And frankly, some of these smaller subcompacts may even struggle to pick up a heavy five foot brush hog. Now the difference on a two series or B series like this B2601 right here is that the machine itself weighs more, okay? So you have more weight up here, you have more three point lift capacity. Short tangent here really quick, check out the video of how much this three point hitch can lift on this B2601. It's pretty insane. Back on track. But while the engine horsepower is virtually the same as what can be found in the subcompact, it's really those other factors that make me a lot more comfortable recommending a 60 inch, knowing that it could have limitations if you are in extremely heavy, dense uh, stem counts and in trunks of trees, that kind of thing as well. If you have an open level field that you're gonna be mowing two or three times a year, and that's really the only place it's gonna be used, you're not going up hills where there's a lot of additional strain on the engine already, I really think you're just fine with a 60 inch on a B series or two series save the 48 inch for the subcompacts can i use a quick hitch with a post hole digger you can see the three points right here these are going to be your two lower links down here and then your top link right here in order to use a post hole digger you need to remove the top link that's on your tractor already so from here to about here is going to be the top link that's on your tractor this replaces it makes a solid connection right there with the base of that top link so while quick hitches are great with a vast majority of equipment out there, there are going to be exceptions. A post hole digger is one. Most finish mowers, for whatever reason, are not quick hitch compatible, as well as older generations of attachments also. The most critical dimensions that you need to keep in mind are going to be the inner and outer spacing between these lower links right here. You can see here that the top link is adjustable, so you have a lot more flexibility that way. Can I add air conditioning to an aftermarket cab? Well, unfortunately, that answer is no, with one caveat. So Curtis cabs are an aftermarket cab manufacturer. They do make a cab. Really, it's only for Kubota subcompact tractors. It's an aftermarket cab that you can add on an AC unit to. That is the only one on the market that I'm aware of you can do that to. Even a beautiful unit like this one right here, which this is a Mauser cab, it is called a factory cab. I think that terminology gets confusing. I think of an OEM right from the factory cab with air conditioning and heat, I consider that to be OEM. So while this can be installed on here from the factory, you take the ROPS off, it is equipped with heat, there's no air conditioning in here, that's a big letdown for me, but you can take the doors off in the summertime at least and treat it like a big old sun canopy on steroids, I guess. At the same time, this cab is super stinking nice and is close to a really built-in factory cab as I've ever seen in the aftermarket world. A cab like this one here on this John Deere 4R series tractor or even a 3R series tractor is going to be what you need to look at. Don't look to the 2 series in John Deere because a factory cab with that air conditioning is not available. However, that new LX series by Kubota along with the predecessor, the B series, does come equipped with a factory cab that has both air conditioning and heat. Why do tractors have things like turn signals, flashers, SMVs, otherwise known as slow moving vehicle signs? Well, in most places, tractors are street legal. So one of the reasons they became street legal is because of safety features like this. Seat belts, maybe those are good for the road too, but they're also good for the farm. But things like flashers or hazards, turn signals, slow moving vehicle signs, tail lights, the list kind of goes on and on. But it's features like this that allow you to drive your tractor more safely down the road. Tractor accidents are actually much more common than you would think because even with all these safety features found on current tractors, it's still really hard to judge just how slow it's moving as you're coming up behind it. Now having a mirror like this, I don't believe is required by law, but it is something commonly found on all cab tractors. The thing I don't get is why does John Deere, Kubota, and so on provide mirror options for cab tractors but not for open station tractors? Don't worry, GoodWorks has you covered. We have links to where you can buy mirrors just like this and mirror extension brackets. You can even angle them out if you wanna have a little bit better visibility. 
These will fit any John Deere loader that has a hole going right through the top of the loader mast here. There's links below where you can buy the mirror extension and the mirror as well. Do I need to get some sort of special rim if I want to use a dual wheel setup on the subcompact tractors or the large garden tractors? Anything with this 26-12-12 rear wheel size. And I think that question stems from a little bit of familiarity with the larger dual wheel setups where they are going to have an integrated lip that's on here. And so you would not run it as a standalone wheel, but it's going to be integrated that way the second wheel will mate right up to it. With this dually adapter kit here from Miller Tire, you do not need to do that. You simply are going to fit the wheel right through here. Then you're going to take the carriage bolt, put it through both wheels there. You can see the square end right on there. It's going to fit right in one of these square holes here. Tighten it down. I've never had a single issue with these shaking loose at all. Link below on where to get this dual adapter kit here. You also get 5% off on dual adapter kits, wheels, tires, anything you find at MillerTire.com. Just use discount code GWT. Is it worth replacing damaged cosmetic parts on my tractor? This is a perfect example right here to sum up my take on this topic. This is a 2019 Kubota B2601. It's got about 70 hours on it or so. You can see it's had a bit of a rough go in its one year of existence. You know, this tractor is really nearly new. It's very low hours. It's really in nice condition overall, besides what you see here and something similar on the other side as well. What I'm told is that this gentleman who owned it just really couldn't figure out how to mount the loader on his machine. So what you see here are the results of his attempts to reattach or detach his loader from his tractor. Now for me, I bought it at a price point knowing I was going to have to replace these because I just don't want to sell tractors in this kind of condition. So the question was posed to me because a customer was going to be selling his tractor, looking at maybe buying a new tractor for me, but wanted to get as much as he could for it on the open market. Perfectly fine. He had some broken panels, that kind of thing, and wondered if he should replace them in order to increase the value. Well, so of course, there's a cost associated with replacing those panels, so it's going to increase the overall cost that you have into the tractor as well. There's always going to be a breaking point there somewhere. You get 100% return on it, that means you broke even. If you get 110%, then it helps you actually make a little bit more money by cleaning up the tractor. So really, it's based on the effort you want to put into it. If you want to sell something that's broken up and clunked up, sell it for a cheaper price and just get out of it. If you want to put more money into it, it's going to clean up the appearance and you're going to be able to charge more for it, even though you're going to have more money into it. But it could help it sell quicker because everybody wants a nice, complete, clean, good looking piece of equipment, right? You want it to run well, you want it to look good. The trade-off is it could sell quicker, but who knows if it's actually gonna sell for more money or break even, or actually you might make a little bit less overall. For me, it's worth it. I knew this was a good machine, very low hours, mechanically sound, just has this cosmetic issue here from a tractor newbie, unfortunately. Well, these questions were all generated by my customers. These are all customer submitted questions to me, whether it was a phone call, an email, Facebook message, something on YouTube, no matter what it was, I just kind of consolidated those interesting ones that I thought may help a lot of others out there. It won't be too long and I'll be back with a volume three. Thanks so much for watching. If you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button right underneath the video. Check out the other videos on my channel and make sure you read through that description below for helpful links for products found in this video, as well as other fun products for tractor owners. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.